Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Wednesday, August 26th, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. Why it's so hard to find dumbbells right now? Why Netflix's upcoming Enola Holmes movie landed them a lawsuit from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate, a model for fighting procrastination, and the one quick fix that could save the lives of hundreds of thousands of birds a year. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. The random shortages that, in hindsight, we should have seen coming continue, and today it is dumbbells. Like a lot of the other shortages, it makes sense once you stop to think about it, and the more savvy among us probably saw it coming. With gyms closed, more people are working out at home, and a lot of those people never worked out at home enough to justify buying equipment before. Some of them may not be ready to or have the space or money to buy big equipment, but an easy first step for home workouts? Dumbbells. A Vox writer recently wrote about a friend of theirs who has been meticulously tracking dumbbell availability for weeks, checking five times a day for various types of dumbbells across multiple brands, and still has trouble finding them. Once they're in stock, they'll often be sold out within minutes. And even the ones that you can buy often have ship dates more than a month in the future. Almost no companies have a full stock. Some only have weights under 30 pounds, others only over 95. Stores like Dick's and Models have close to zero and aren't shipping them. Amazon, even with Prime, it'll take a month to get to you. And meanwhile, people are selling them at huge markups on eBay, where a simple 15-pound pair is currently going for $169. Icon Health and Fitness, a family of fitness brands which includes Nordic Track, said that sales were 200% higher in March of this year versus March of 2019, 400% higher in April, and 600% higher in May. Bowflex says that the second quarter of 2020 was one of their strongest quarters ever in the history of their company. Like all shortages we're seeing, the supply chain just wasn't ready for this unusual demand. First of all, free weights like dumbbells aren't the most popular home workout equipment. Quoting Vox, Treadmills, which are priced much higher, are still the biggest sellers in both numbers and revenue. According to a 2019 report from the National Sporting Goods Association, around 3.9 million units of free weights were sold in 2018, compared to 5.2 million motorized treadmills. End quote. And further, free weights usually start to increase popularity in the fall, peak around New Year's, and then taper off again in the spring and summer when people start going outdoors for recreation. So basically, the time when companies are used to selling the least is right when the unprecedented demand hits. And like so many items that got caught with a long-term shortage, most of the world's dumbbells are made in China. With Chinese factories shutting down before lockdowns began in the U.S., there was already a supply chain shortage before the demand from homebound Americans even started. Quoting again, It takes a month or so to get the products made and get them to port, said Colleen Logan, the vice president of marketing at Icon Health and Fitness. Then it goes from China to the United States, landing, she says, in Long Beach, California. And then if they're going to the East Coast, they have to go through the Panama Canal. Once weights do get to America, ports, too, are subject to lockdowns and social distancing, adding even more delays. The weights, through their shipping delays and lockdowns, seemingly complete a March of the Penguins-like migration. We had to triple our capacity for the second half of this year and have spent the last few months seeking out new factories to work with, said John Freed, Director of Global Marketing and Communications at Nautilus Inc. For reference, it can take up to months, if not longer, to ramp up a new factory. Globally, product demand continues at a high level, so we're constantly making changes to our operations to deliver products as fast as possible. End quote. So it might be a while before dumbbells are easily available again, but that's probably okay, because even with gyms reopening in some places, a lot of people aren't going to feel safe returning anytime soon. And even if they did, now that they've spent so much tripping out their home gym, would they want to? On that note, if you're really in the market for some home workout equipment, I got a tip in my neighborhood subreddit that a lot of gyms that are closing permanently are getting rid of their equipment. So if you've got one of those near you, give them a call. You might be able to score some gear on the cheap.
Yesterday, Netflix dropped the first trailer for Enola Holmes, an original movie starring Millie Bobby Brown as the teenage sister of Sherlock Holmes, played by Henry Cavill. It also stars Helena Bonham Carter as their mother and looks truly awesome. And it also landed Netflix a lawsuit with the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate, which as it turns out is not too uncommon of a thing. First, the movie is based on a series of young adult books of the same name by Nancy Springer, which first came out in 2006. These six books, although they have all been published for a decade, were also included in the 2020 lawsuit from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate, along with Netflix, Legendary Pictures, and PCMA Productions. Now, people have been borrowing from the Sherlock Holmes stories for years. By some definitions, it's the most adapted property of all time. It's traditionally pointed to in media studies as the first fandom, one that was organized, passionate, and is still active today. So fan fiction has of course abounded for over a century. And while proper, legally sanctioned adaptations were often authorized in the early days by Conan Doyle himself and later by the estate, they exploded over the past few decades as the Sherlock Holmes stories came into the public domain. In the United Kingdom and Canada, they first entered public domain in 1980. But the rights were revived again in 1996 and then expired again, putting the stories back in the public domain in 2000. But in the United States, it's been more complicated, and a slew of lawsuits over the years has led to one strange quirk. Ten of the later stories, ones published between 1923 and 1927, actually aren't in the domain yet and won't be until the last day of 2022 or perhaps later if the Conan Doyle estate has anything to say about that. They have issued lawsuits for a number of adaptations over the years for ones that they claim pull from those later stories, most prolifically against American novelist and lawyer Leslie S. Klinger, but also against the 2015 Ian McKellen film Mr. Holmes. But neither of those adaptations were explicit adaptations of the later stories. No, the delineation for what counts as being inspired by those later stories is not so clean-cut. While trying desperately to cling on to their control of the stories, the estate has basically come up with this. In those later stories, Sherlock becomes kinder, more sympathetic, more human. While we might occasionally see that kind of character growth by the end of some Sherlock adaptations, he's generally overall a prickly, robotic character. That's how we know him. And that common characterization is largely because any time a book, movie, or TV show sets out to portray a kind-hearted Sherlock, the estate comes knocking with a lawsuit, or they try to make the author or production company in question license the character from them. Because if Sherlock is too kind, if his relationship with Watson is too friendly, then clearly that version of Sherlock is actually based on the later books, and those are still under copyright. Quoting a section of the estate's complaint to Netflix in June, After the stories that are now in the public domain and before the copyrighted stories, the Great War happened. In World War I, Conan Doyle lost his eldest son, Arthur Allen Kingsley. Four months later, he lost his brother, Brigadier General Ennis Doyle. When Conan Doyle came back to Holmes and the copyrighted stories between 1923 and 1927, it was no longer enough that the Holmes character was the most brilliant, rational, and analytical mind— Holmes needed to be human. The character needed to develop human connection and empathy. Conan Doyle made the surprising artistic decision to have his most famous character, known around the world as a brain without a heart, develop into a character with a heart. Holmes becomes warmer. He became capable of friendship. He could express emotion. He began to respect women. End quote. It's an interesting literary interpretation, but considering just how many stories came before those which established the characters so thoroughly even before this change of heart, and how any good story is going to show some growth in humanity to the detective, it really just comes off as a cash grab on the part of the estate. Like the movie Mr. Holmes, because it does take place toward the end of Sherlock's life, without going back to revisit that movie and every Sherlock story ever, I will maybe give them. But the Enola Holmes book series doesn't even have Sherlock as the main character. It's a light-hearted kid's book, of course Sherlock is going to be a bit nicer. If someone is outright adapting the later stories, sure, but you can't sue every adaptation that lets Sherlock smile or respect women. 
According to Netflix AOL's response to the estate's complaint from June, filed on the 14th of this month, they deny pretty much all of the estate's allegations that any use of the characters in the movie are under copyright, and say they still intend to release the film. Which is pretty much what everyone has said when confronted by the state on this matter, including all of the judges. So, Enola Holmes is not in danger of being pulled, and based on the Conan Doyle estate's track record with courts in the US, Netflix probably won't even be paying any court fees. Procrastination. I'm guilty of it. You probably are too. Most people are. You might even be procrastinating by listening to this podcast. And for anyone new to working from home, your procrastination might be at an all-time high. I mean, there are so many distractions at home. Your TV, your video games, those books you're always meaning to read, even just the dishes that need doing or the dog that needs walking. Never mind the emotional distractions of living through this totally weird time of our lives. So you may need a little nudge on fighting procrastination. And here it is. I recently came across the FOG behavior model that breaks down why we do or do not take action on a given thing. And the folks at deprocrastination.co used the model to suggest some ways to change that behavior. So the FOG behavior model, as developed by BJ Fogg, a Stanford professor, is behavior equals motivation plus ability plus trigger. So to achieve a behavior, to take action, you must have motivation, ability, and a trigger, or a prompt. Motivation may seem like the toughest one, so we will start there. Deep procrastination suggests really going deep to think about why you have to do something. Quoting deep procrastination, there probably was a reason why you wrote down a task or got one assigned to you. Was it to help you learn something? Was it to make you money? Was it to help someone? Take a task you're putting off and try to remember in vivid detail why you thought you needed to do it. The important part is not only to know the reason, but to feel it, to get excited about it. How to do that? Link the task to a personal goal that you want to achieve. Attach exciting reasons to that task. For example, write a thesis. Not motivating. Write a thesis to successfully complete a degree and do cutting-edge research. Write a thesis to deepen your understanding of a subject and get recognized by others in your field. Write a thesis to help others see more clearly and make progress. End quote. It might be a stretch and you might not always believe it, but even the exercise of trying to think of those things can remind you why you're doing what you're doing. Now, for ability, you probably have the ability to do whatever it is on your to-do list, but sometimes a task is tough. You know, maybe you literally don't have the tools or resources that you need, in which case you should reach out and find a way to get them. Other times you might simply feel intimidated and not good enough, and that makes sense. But usually putting something off does not stop it from being tough. In fact, when you leave yourself with less time, it's often even tougher. The best way to combat this is by breaking the project down into small, achievable tasks. And to do that, you're going to have to start early, which could be a piece of the motivation. You know, why are you doing this small task today? Because you want the job to ultimately be easier over time, so there's your motivation. And breaking it down into small tasks that you can schedule out leading up to the deadline can also be a form of a trigger. A trigger is something pushing you to do the task, like putting it on your schedule. Triggers are easier when they're external, you know, like an athlete with a coach who is literally telling them to stop and start at certain times. But all on our own, it's more challenging. Deep procrastination suggests starting and ending the day by looking at your to-do list and deciding what you'll work on first. At the start of the day, give yourself a finite amount of time to decide what you're going to work on, and if you outrun that time, you choose randomly. At the end of the day, you decide what you're going to work on first tomorrow and leave yourself some kind of reminder or starting point for that, like writing the title of a document and leaving that file open on your computer. The more reminders you can place for yourself and the more specific you can be about what to achieve and when to do it, the more likely you are to do it. But going back to the model again, behavior equals motivation, plus ability, plus trigger. It's a model of all behavior, not just a procrastination hack. So let's look at it with regards to other behavior. For example, quoting deep procrastination, checking messages or notifications, motivation, is anything new, did someone like my post, ability, or what you need to do, just reach for your phone and tap, and trigger, a notification, or finding yourself bored wherever you can access your phone, end quote. 
So all three elements are there, and they're all way easier to do just without thinking about it than the many steps and mind tricks of getting yourself to take action on something you're actually supposed to be doing. Which is why it is so important to cut out distractions and make plans for your motivation, ability, and triggers. Leave your phone in another room. Use apps and extensions to restrict sites or block notifications. Quoting once more, If you have distracting apps uninstalled from your phone, your phone in another room, and distractions on your computer blocked, you'll find yourself bored. You'll have a moment of, what do I do now? But instead of choosing to get distracted in those moments, the default response, choose to do something else, like work. Even mild work, reading, reviewing, short emails, is better than checking Twitter or Reddit or YouTube because it will help you feel accomplishment and pride, which will boost your mood, which is scientifically proven to improve performance even more. End quote. The key really is those small tasks, which add up over time and help you keep your motivation up to continue as the tasks get bigger or grow on top of one another. Now, I know none of this is necessarily groundbreaking, but sometimes hearing it all in a new light can be the little kick of motivation that you need to actually take action. Sometimes the solution is so easy, we really should have seen it sooner. First, the problem. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, about 300,000 birds were killed by wind turbines in 2015. This huge number is often cited by people as a reason why we shouldn't use wind turbines. But it's important to note that 300,000 is probably two orders of magnitude fewer than how many birds die each year by just running into power lines. And less birds are dying each year from the wind turbines as they continue to be designed with ever bigger, slower moving blades. But a study out of Norway has come up with a solution much more effective than simply larger or slower blades. Painting the blades black. The whole problem with birds dying at the hands of wind turbines is believed to be in large part because they can't see the blades when they're flying. So painting them a bolder color, the hope was they'd actually notice it. And as far as the study in Norway went, it worked. There was a 71.9% reduction in avian deaths. Now, the study was based on just a few wind turbines, and they saw a curious variation across the seasons, so more studies definitely need to be done. But with such a big margin of success, I think it's safe to say painting turbine blades black certainly can't hurt. That's it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kaki.org. I'm off to see how much I can get for my 15-year-old 10-pound weights on eBay. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.